Thank you for tuning into this future seminar. Today we mark the release of our quarterly print publication, Farsight. This one is titled Safeguarding Tomorrow, Humanity's Responsibility to Future Generations. A big title, we know. Uh, it is dedicated to exploring the, um, the practical, ethical and moral um, implications of accepting uh, an obligation to future generations. So this issue explores uh, a number of themes, including the question why present bias permeates so much of our decision making, how we can provide political representation for future generations, uh, as well as more provocative questions like um, whether the demands for a livable planet uh, in the future might provoke acts of eco-sabotage in the present. If you'd like to dive into it, I encourage you to go to uh, our online shop and pick up a copy, or you can subscribe to Farsight by becoming a member of the Institute. I promise you we'll share some links and QR codes uh, to all of that towards the end of the, the seminar. Um, <clears throat> Farsight is of course published by the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, which is a non-profit futures think tank located in Copenhagen, Denmark. And aside from hosting these seminars and publishing Farsight, we also um, uh, offer advisory services. We host courses and talks and much more. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Institute and our work, I encourage you to go to cifs.dk and, uh, and check us out. So my name is Kasper Skorko Petersen and I'm the head of publications here at the Institute. Um, and today I've invited two very special guests to join us in this conversation. In the first part of the seminar, we are joined by Sophie Howe, who has just finished her tenure as the world's first uh, future generations commissioner in Wales. If there's anyone who knows something about bridging futures thinking and governance and policy making, it is Sophie Howe. So we're very excited to have her on today. Uh, our second guest, Dr. Alice Hughes, is a conservation biologist from University of Hong Kong, where she teaches as an associate professor. Uh, we'll talk to Alice about the myth of overpopulation, this idea that there will simply be too many people on planet Earth in the future. And we'll um, learn a few things about why that is both an oversimplification and potentially also counterproductive from an ecological point of view. Again, thank you for tuning in and let's get started with uh, today's program. Um, is it possible to represent future generations in any meaningful way, given that they do not yet exist and therefore have no way of selecting representatives or having their voices heard? Uh, despite these obvious obstacles, there is a growing movement underway that seeks to do just this. In Wales, the world's first future generations commissioner, Sophie Howe, just finished her seven-year term. We're very pleased to have her tuning in to the seminar today. Welcome to the seminar, Sophie Howe, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. So, and to all of you watching, uh, we'll have a short audience Q&A after my questions for Sophie. So please write your questions in the chat window. And my colleague will pick some out and we'll, uh, we'll get to those uh, after um, my talk with, uh, with Sophie. So uh, first off, uh, Sophie, can you give us a sense of what a future generations commissioner actually does? What does the job entail and what is the relationship between the commissioner and the Welsh government? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing to say is that the commissioner is independent of the Welsh government because the commissioner has to hold the government and a, a number of our other public institutions, so our local authorities, our health institutions, some of our national agencies like Public Health Wales and Natural Resources Wales, which is our environment agency. The commissioner has to hold those organisations to account on how they are reaching um, seven long-term wellbeing goals, which are set out in our, in our future generation. Act. Um, so to that end, um, the Commissioner monitors and assesses the progress that's being made. Um, the Commissioner can provide advice and support 
to those organisations on how they should meet these long term wellbeing goals um, and can also review um, particular decisions or um, particular ways of, of doing things. And one of the last things that I did in my last year as Commissioner was to review the Welsh Government's civil service to understand how well they were implementing the Future Generations Act. Um, and from that, we've set a joint improvement plan for things that they could do be, uh, better. And why do you think Wales was the first country in the world to have uh, such an office set up? Is it a coincidence or do you think there's a reason for it? Well, Wales has had a long history with sustainable development. Um, when the Welsh Parliament and the Welsh Government was established following a referendum back in uh, 1997, so it was established in 1999, in the Government of Wales Act it said that sustainable development should be a central organising principle of the government. And that's important, of course, but actually in reality that didn't mean an awful lot. That meant that uh, usually the Environment Minister would bring a report to the Parliament once a year, um, but nobody could really say that it was a central organising principle. So as with many of these types of really progressive initiatives, it's, you know, one politician or a handful of politicians backed by civic society, NGOs, a campaign building to say we could do better in Wales. Um, and then a conversation with the citizens of Wales where the question was posed, what's the Wales you want to leave behind to your children and your grandchildren and future generations to come? And that's what led to the development of the, um, of the Future Generations Act in Wales. And of course, we're a small nation, just over three million people. So I think sometimes it's easier to get things done in Wales, but also if it works in Wales, you know, we're big enough to say, well, actually, um, there are opportunities, therefore, to scale that up to other countries. Hmm. And obviously, the constituency of this office is quite a unique one in that they, they don't yet exist. They haven't yet been born. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you how we can possibly know what the wishes of these people will be. But then as I was writing my questions, I sort of stopped myself and thought, well, I mean, is it really that complex? You know, wouldn't they want the same things that we want? That is healthy lives, safety, a clean environment, resilient communities and so on. Um, and I suppose it's no coincidence that um, many of the same things as I just mentioned, are reflected in these well-being goals that you uh, that you just uh, mentioned. Can can you tell us a bit more about how um, about these goals and how you arrived at them? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I can't predict the future. You can't. No one can predict the future, and you know, we can't possibly you know predict with absolute accuracy what those people who aren't yet born will possibly want or how the world specifically might have changed but i think that there are you know some fundamental principles as you said they'll probably want to be um you know healthy and you know have good uh, well-being they'll want you know they'll want there to be a planet that they can actually live on uh, for a start and they'll want their ecosystems to be working for them um the way in which we devise these seven long-term goals is in conversation with the citizens citizens of wales where we pose that question what's the wales you want to leave behind. We also looked at the time, it was fortuitous that the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals were in development, so we looked at what was happening at a global level. Um, we have seven wellbeing goals, there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but actually if we look at the statutory definitions of our goals, they very much align um, with the um, SDGs. One element which isn't included in the SDGs but is included in Wales is um, the, the, the sort of principles around culture. So when we talk about sustainable development globally, we generally talk about social, economic and environmental sustainability. In Wales, we have a fourth uh, pillar of sustainability, which is recognising the importance of people's culture, heritage, language and so on in terms of their overall well-being, both now and into the future. And I think that that's a really good and important addition. Mm. So when you spoke to us a few months ago for, for this publication here, you, you had this great quote, and I'm just going to read it out. You said that in the grand scheme of things, we are currently a tiny existence compared to those 6.75 trillion people expected to be born during the next 50,000 years. The actions we take or do not take today will impact every single one of them. And of course, it's absolutely true that when we talk about future generations, we're not just talking about our immediate descendants, uh, but also people born hundreds or even thousands mm -hmm. of years um, 
from now and the world will look very different than it does today. Um, does the work of the commissioner deal with these uh, far future, almost cosmic time frames, or are you more concerned with the near future, looking a few decades uh, into the into the future? Well, the Future Generations Commissioner and the Future Generations Act in Wales, um, it's only seven years old. Um, I chose to look more to the nearer future because let's be honest, we have enough, you know, we've got a big enough task getting our politicians to think 20 years down the line, 50 years down the line. Um, and the further out you take that, um, I'm not saying that it's not important, of course it is, but the less certainty you have of what the issues are going to be and the more difficult it is to get people um, to envisage and take action today to affect that future. Um, so I've really started with the, with the nearer term future. Um, that's not to say that the next future generations commissioner or another one to come might not be in that space of, you know, what might we all be living on Mars in, um, you know, in, in 2075 or whatever it might be. Um, but I think that I'm quite a pragmatic person. I believe you have to start, particularly with policymakers, and I've worked around um, politicians, policymakers, public institutions throughout my career, and you have to start where they're at and take them forward in an iterative um, way if you're going to get them on board. Hmm. Whales on Mars, I like that one. <laughs> so um, I guess you can compare the role of the commissioner sort of uh, to uh, watchdog of uh, what kind of policies are developed and, and how uh, far-sighted or near-sighted they are. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you just ended your, your seven-year uh, tenure as commissioner. How have you seen your work lead to uh, changes in policy in Wales? Well, there have been some really significant um, changes in policy. That's not to say that we are perfect and that's not to say that we don't have some real ongoing challenges. But I suppose the biggest transformation, um, the most tangible transformation has been um, in our policy relating to um, climate and transport. So the first big test of the Future Generations Act was the government had plans to spend the entire of their borrowing capacity building a 13 mile stretch of motorway to deal with a problem um, of congestion on, a, on an existing motorway. Um, and I intervened as Future Generations Commissioner in that issue when I asked the government to explain to me how they'd applied the Future Generations Act to that decision. Um, and they really struggled to do that. I asked them to explain to me what future trends they'd applied and scenarios, how they were accounting for the possibility of driverless vehicles, how they were accounting for, you know, this was actually pre-pandemic, the trends there, which we saw accelerated of people working from home, um, how they were considering it, um, the proposed in light of our climate reduction tar you know our carbon uh, reduction targets and um, how they consider the goal of a healthier Wales when actually what we need to do or part of what we need to do with to deal with an obesity crisis to, is to get people out of their cars um, into public transport active travel and so on um, how they were thinking about the goal of a more equal Wales because 25 percent of the lowest income families in that region don't have access to um, a car because they can't afford one so when you have this framework which requires you to look to the long term which requires you to test all of your policies against seven well-being goals it's really quite it's not easy because people like to do what they've always done but it does give the commissioner power to really sort of challenge that and those proposals were scrapped and not only were those proposals scrapped we've um, shifted from spending two thirds of our infrastructure investment budget on building roads and that's gone down to a third with that money being invested in public transport. We've just had a roads review which has announced the cancellation of most major road building schemes in Wales because they don't align with the Future Generations Act. We've got a new transport strategy. We've got 20 mile an hour zones being rolled out as standard across Wales. So a huge transformation in that area, but also in terms of our education curriculum. 
big reforms there to make sure that our kids are educated in a way which is aligned with the Future Generations Act, where we are placing their health and well-being and skills for the future, like creativity, like collaboration and empathy, emotional intelligence, right at the forefront of what they learn in schools. And similarly, in terms of our plans to be a zero waste nation by 2050, um, all of these have come as a result of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act um, and many more. So is it completely transformational? Um, not yet in seven years, um, but we're going in the right direction. Mm. And so um, Wales also recently lowered the, the voting age to uh, 16 for parliamentary and local elections. Mm -hmm. And I know that during mm -hmm. your time as commissioner, you set up something called reverse mentorship programs where you paired young people mm -hmm. with uh, current leaders across uh, sectors and, and industries. What is it that the youth and young generations can contribute to our decision making that older generations mm -hmm. might not be able to? Well, I mean, you know, most people in senior decision making roles are in their 40s, 50s or 60s. That means, um, you know, they're not digital natives. Um, they've probably never experienced or won't experience climate anxiety in the same way as our young young people experience. Um, they are experiencing the world, you know, or they have experienced the world of work in a completely different way to how our younger people are um, experiencing it and want to experience it um, and so on. And they had dis different, you know, aspirations and opportunities for the future. The really sad reality is that in the UK and indeed in many other countries, this next generation is going to be the first generation that has almost fared worse than their parents. So, you know, the economic impact of climate change, the fact that, um, you know, home ownership in the UK has been, you know, very significant over decades and decades. Young people now don't really stand a chance of owning um, a home and so on. So there are some real sort of challenges. And um, we're asking our current leaders to take decisions which, um, you know, will impact for decades and decades to come. And so they need to do that in with the realization of how things work and uh, for younger people and what younger people are thinking and that's why I established this reverse mentoring program so that there can be almost a safe space between um, you know a future leader let's uh, put it like that a young person and a current leader where the current leaders can test you know the things that they're doing and how that works for the younger generation and it's hugely powerful having a younger person eyeballing a current leader and saying why are you doing that or have you considered me or you know you wouldn't do that in a digital world which you might not appreciate or understand but you just wouldn't do it like that so um a powerful thing to do i think mm. and so um my final question uh sophie to you before we go to some of the audience questions when you look Beyond your home country, how would you characterize the state of um, anticipatory governance, we could call it, internationally? Um, this is obviously still quite a niche concept, but are we heading in the right direction or is it going fast enough? What do you think? Um, I think we're making some progress. I don't think we're making quick enough progress. Um, the most exciting thing I think that's happening at the moment is the potential for a UN declaration for future generations. Um, we're expecting to see that either this year or next year. We're expecting to see the appointment of a UN special envoy for future generations, um, most likely this year. That's the sort of UN equivalent of my role. Um, if we have that UN declaration, of course, you know um, that won't necessarily what happens in across the UN member states won't necessarily mirror exactly what's happened in Wales but the member states signing up to that declaration will be saying we're signing up to um, embedding um, anticipatory government governance future generations thinking whatever you want to call it in our structures of governance and that has some huge um, huge potential um, there are also other countries who are starting to adopt future generations legislation and the Scottish Parliament um, is taking some legislation through on my last day as commissioner a bill was laid in the Irish Parliament for a future generations act so that was quite a nice leaving gift um, so there is progress, 
I think there's some real challenges between um, countries who are taking an approach around well-being index indexes and indices um, and well-being metrics, countries who are really trying to make progress on the sustainable development goals, and countries who, do, who are doing interesting things on futures. Often you don't see those three things coming together as they have in the Welsh legislation. And I think it's important that those things come together because none of them can really be achieved without each other. We won't meet the sustainable development goals if we don't take long term thinking. We won't meet wellbeing metrics if we don't do future generations thinking. So I think we need to bring all of those things together in a holistic way. And that's the big challenge for countries across the world. Mm. Now let's move on to a few audience questions we've got. Some good ones here. Um, the first one from uh, Ben Capper, who asks, uh, can you talk more about the process of engaging citizens in the discussion of what kind of whales they would like to leave for the future? How is this democratic process facilitated best? So in Wales, and I'm not saying we've got, you know, the right answer or, or, or the best answer, there are there are other ways of um, doing this, but um, the government commissioned or worked with a, um, an NGO um, who reached out to a range of different communities, organisations, different, um, you know, community groups and so on to pose those questions. So there were town hall meetings, there were online platforms, there were discussion groups in the Young Farmers Association and in the Women's Institute and amongst young people's forums and so on. Um, some local local areas held their own conversation called, you know, the Flanethly we want or the Swansea we want and, and uh, reached into their different communities to hold these conversations. And then all of the data and the views um, from those conversations filtered back up um, to work through then what you know what are the key issues that are that are coming out and I think there are about 13 different things that people said things like they felt that their culture and heritage was a really important thing that they wanted to pass on to the you know to future generations that they really valued their natural our natural assets in Wales and we needed to protect them that actually we wanted to make sure that Wales was a fair and equal society so a number of those uh, principles came out now there are other ways I'm doing some work at the moment for the School of International Futures um, and they have a, a program of work around citizens dialogues around building in anticipatory futures and these conversations with citizens so um, lots of kind of ways of, of, um, of doing it but that's how we did it in Wales mm. Um, a question here from uh, Brianna Nicholas, who asks, do you think uh, public bodies are more well equipped at dealing with the issue of intergenerational justice than NGOs and or private actors, or do each of their own or do each have their mm -hmm. own unique role to play? Yes, I think the latter, really. Um, you know, I have found that there are some public institutions that really get this, um, you know, got it right from the beginning. So, for example, our public health institutions, um, quite interesting there, because when you start, it started its life as a Sustainable Development Act, it morphed in the, pass in the course of its passage into a Future Generations Act. Um, and if you talk about sustainable development, it tends to be the domain of environmental NGOs who were really critical in pushing the agenda forward. But I think if it hadn't widened out um, uh, to other sectors, it perhaps might not be have been so successful. So quite quickly, the public health um, sector started thinking, hang on a minute, this is actually a public health act. This is about long term investment now in health and well-being and the wider determinants of health, which we need to create um, a healthy nation. Um, and so, you know, there are some of those organisations and then there are also some organisations and you always get them who are laggards and have to be convinced and persuaded and sometimes dragged um, along. And likewise, you see that with the private sector in particular, but I've also seen some brilliant practice in the private sector. One of the things that happened last year is um, if you're a football fan, you might know that Wales got to go to the World Cup for the first time in 64 years. So this was a very exciting moment for Wales. And what happened just a few days before they went to the World Cup? Well, the Football Association of Wales launched their sustainability strategy, that Wales well-being in the world, aiming to be the most sustainable football association in the world, all based around the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Now, they don't have to do that. 
There's not a law that requires them to do that, but they have got on board with it because our government, our country has set out this long term vision, which Team Wales, whether that's a football team or whether that's Team Wales being everyone, can get behind. And that's incredibly um, powerful. And we're also seeing that with our voluntary sector and our NGOs and, and so on. Right. There's a slightly related uh, question here from uh, Alice Toby Brandt, who asks, um, how would you suggest we engage with people who are not interested in or skeptical of issues that could affect future generations, the, the laggards, I suppose, or stakeholders who are weary of collaborating with the commission? Mm, yeah, really, really good question. Um, I think my sort of primary answer to that um, is that you've got to inspire. Um, and I think sometimes when we talk about futures, you know, even if you think about popular culture, if you think about the dramas you see on television, the films that we see in the, the cinema, if you think of, you know, books that are written, they're always, or 99% of them are based on some sort of dystopian future. Um, and I think that there's something about creating a positive future and working with people to inspire them about a positive vision for the future and the way in which they can contribute to that. So we have small community groups um, aligning themselves with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and sometimes they are challenging their public institutions in their area because they're not going far enough. And that's really good. We need to give people this framework of inspiration to say, well, there are now these legal duties for your public bodies to be taking these things on board. And you can use this framework both to contribute in the way that you might do in a community and to challenge your own um, institutions. Other times, I think there has to be a bit of a wake up call. So on on that issue that I described around the cancellation of the motorway, um, I think it's fair to say that um, a lot of the private sector were very disappointed by that. Um, they thought that it was a done deal, that you know it was definitely going to happen because whenever there's an argument between economy versus environment, um, economy always wins and environment always loses. Um, whenever there's a problem with congestion, the answer is build a bigger road. Um, and I think they were quite shocked and taken aback that this new law, which they weren't really interested in, was suddenly making an impact. And there, OK, you know, I had some quite challenging discussions with our Confederation of Industry um, and representatives from the private sector. But actually, what we're now talking about is, OK, if we're transitioning in this way and if we've got these long term aspirations, what are the things we need to be working on collectively together? So when I proposed to the government a set of uh, policies around COVID recovery, investing in the green transition, investing in um, green skills and so on, actually, the Confederation of British Industry um, wrote to the First Minister and said we completely endorse these ideas. So I think that there's a collection of things. Having a law is certainly helpful, but I think you've got to inspire, you've got to find the people who are doing good things and promote them and get behind them and have their backs. Um, you've got to sometimes, you know, tell people how it is and tell people that it's going to change, um, a bit of shock and awe maybe. Um, and, you know, I think that we're in this for the long haul. There's no one solution to suddenly changing overnight the habits of many lifetimes, which are, which are short term silo based work in and discounting the interests of future generations. Mm. So, uh, Sophie, we have you for a few more minutes. So let me do one more question from the audience. Uh, this one is from uh, Simon Oestergaard, who asks, are future generations legislations and similar initiatives currently taking a backseat due to the immediate incentives for governments to focus on the global inflation crisis, global conflicts, etc. Mm. Um, I don't know if they're taking um, a backseat. I think that, um, you know, certainly it is, you know, this, this is a challenge that has forever been thus. Since I took up post in 2016, there has not been a single year that I've not had conversations and discussions and challenging conversations with government where they're saying we can't do it now because we're trying to deal with all of these things over there. You know, it was Brexit, it was COVID, 
it was the cost of living crisis, it's the war in Ukraine. We have to accept that, you know, we are in these, you know, this, the, the buzzword of the moment, poly crisis, and crisis is the, is the new normal. What I think having a future generations framework does, it's never going to find you more headspace and capacity in a system to uh you, you know to respond to the crises as well as doing really comprehensive futures planning but it does provide you with that framework that stop and think which has happened in wales stop and think are we going to respond to the crisis like this which is just a short-term immediate response or are we going to respond in a broader way which has benefits in terms of dealing with the crisis now and dealing um you know having benefits for future generations so things like investing in improving the quality of people's homes that takes people out of fuel poverty at the moment it creates jobs uh, for people at the moment it helps us to meet our long longer term carbon emissions targets it regenerates communities in in the long term it's one of those things that you can do which has benefits both for both current and future generations and deals or helps to deal with some of the the crises um, that we're in at the moment and what i say is you must seek those solutions first you must seek those solutions um, and enact those solutions that are good for current and future generations. And having a legal frame which, which, a framework which requires you to do that is helpful, um, but it's not a silver bullet. Right. I think that's a good place to end it. So again, Sophie Howe, thank you for joining us, for taking our questions and for sharing your insights and experiences with us here today. Thank you so much. And uh, to the audience, we'll be right back with our next segment and with Dr. Alice Hughes. So stay tuned. <laughs>
The 20th century was a unique time in human history in many different ways, one of them being the explosive population growth witnessed across the world. Since around 1950, the global population has more than tripled from 2.5 billion to around 8 billion people alive today. Demographic projections indicate that sometime during the 21st century we'll reach 10 billion or maybe even 11 billion people. Along with this explosion in the human population, we've seen the accelerated degradation of natural environments across the world as a result of human activities. This correlation might lead you to think that um, the population growth in isolation is the primary issue driving biodiversity loss and ecological decline. It's a view that came into the mainstream in the 60s, especially with the population, the pu uh, publication rather of the population bomb by, in 1968. Uh, but the idea has many proponents to this day and has been influ influential in shaping uh, policies and mindsets since then. But it is both a dangerous and misguided notion to focus too much on population alone argues Dr. Alice Hughes, who is a cons conservation biologist excuse me, at the University of Hong Kong. The overpopulation narrative, she believes, pushes us towards uh, counterproductive solutions to the biodiversity crisis. We're now joined by Alice Hughes to learn more about, about why that is. So welcome to the studio, Alice, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, and good evening or good afternoon to everyone there. Right, we have a bit of a time difference, so it's around 11 o'clock where you are, so we'll go for half an hour or so and we'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, but uh, you take aim at the idea that there is a direct link between ec ecological decline and population growth and that the future solutions to the biodiversity crisis will need some sort of strict uh, measure like population control. What is it that's so misguided about this idea? Well, there's two major issues here. One is that the narrative is simply incorrect. Um, and the other is that by focusing on this narrative rather than developing the kinds of solutions we need, we actually don't move forwards in the way we need to. So a really good example of this is the fact that if we look at the highest consuming countries, places like Qatar, the average Qatari consumes about 30 times the amount of resources as the average Eritrean person. And so let's say, OK, you're all only allowed to have one child now. The reality is that's not going to make any real difference to the amount of consumption, because in those countries that are consuming very little, they are not having a huge impact on global consumption. However, as these countries transition, as they are going to into the state that many of the Western democracies have already done, and those population increases decrease, the per capita consumption is going to increase exponentially. So if we don't start developing solutions so that they can reach a higher life quality without consuming the same amounts as your average Qatari, we are going to have a huge issue. Furthermore, by continuing this narrative, we continue to scapegoat developing economies. And so rather than developing the types of solutions we need around consumption, we continue to say, oh, it's their fault and absolve ourselves of the responsibility that we need to be accountable for if we are going to develop the types of solutions we so urgently need. Why do you think this idea of population degrowth, especially in developing economies as an environmental solution or a solution to other issues like food security, for instance, is so widespread? I think it's because it's the most simple and naive solution. And it's true that as humans colonized the planet, we did drive other species extinct. However, we have now decoupled that relationship and the footprint of individuals through individual choices and societal choices means that that relationship is now far more complicated. And unless we desire, um, actually target consumption, if we look at waste, if we look at the amount of inventory organizations like Amazon throw away, if we don't explore consumption, we will not actually be able to develop solutions. But that's a much more complex argument. 
And so it's much simpler to just say, oh, there's too many people eating rather than thinking, hang on a minute, that person and that person are consuming vastly different amounts in very different ways. And the solution to one is much simpler than the solution to the other. Um, so what are, in your view, what's the, what are some of the best examples of how um, inequitable consumption rather than overpopulation is what's driving um, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss? Well, let's take, for a start, the most simple one, what we eat. Many of the older members of this audience will remember when they were growing up, when strawberries were something you had, when they were available for a few weeks in the middle of the summer. Now you can get strawberries on Christmas Day because they're imported into our countries where they're out of season. But that means that these cash crops are being grown in other countries instead of growing food in those countries. Um, if we think about meat consumption, meat requires vastly more land and vastly more resources. It's very energetically inefficient to produce meat. And yet the amount of meat consumption has increased radically. So now people aren't just having it once a week or once a month. They're now having it sometimes multiple times a day. And what many people will not be aware of is not only is that huge uh, in terms of its consumption footprint, many of the cattle, for example, are being fed on soy. So it's having a much bigger footprint. And in addition, that soy, when people say, oh, it's the vegans' fault, the Amazon's being destroyed to grow soy, actually a lot of that soy is for feedstocks and for biofuels. And so once again, these types of consumption choices are having a huge impact. Something else that also gets forgotten are things like the pet trade and the fashion trade. Now, these are examples where there is absolutely no relationship with population. And yet we know of species that are potentially going extinct because they are in such demand for the pet trade. These are associated with wealth, they're associated with fashion, and they have absolutely zero relationship with population. But unless we start understanding what those consumption footprints look like, then those species get left out in the cold until we have entirely collected out their wild populations. And just think of the tigers. There are now more tigers in captivity than there are in the wild. They're a high status symbol, but it reminds us that unless we understand why species are being driven extinct, we cannot develop the solutions to prevent that from happening. And so um, you believe that the overpopulation narrative is not only false, but that the solutions proposed to it, things like population control or advocating for depopulation um, in developing economies can be, uh, can actually have a destructive effect as well. Um, this might seem a little counterintuitive that fewer people might lead to might lead to biodiversity loss as well. So perhaps you can you can uh, explain to us Elaborate how this works. That. Yeah. Yep. So let's think about places like the UK or Japan, where populations are now showing that decline, but their consumption per capita is far larger than that of many developing economies. Now, whilst education whilst helping with family planning are good and they also increase life quality. If we do not also put in place mechanisms that help ensure that as these countries transition, they transition sustainably, then actually you just help them to the high consumption phase of uh, the demographic transition faster without implementing the solutions you need to try to transition that. What we need to be looking at is how in developed economies, when we are consuming far more than this planet can take, how can we reduce that whilst maintaining quality of life? And this is why things like meat alternatives, less meat intensive lifestyles, thinking about where fashion, where pets, et cetera, come from, thinking about energy generation are all critically important rather than just saying, well, there are too many of them. Mm. It's also important to consider other processes that happen as we see a reduction in the rates of population growth, things like urbanization. And you might think, oh, well, urbanization is great. There's going to be less people in the countryside. It can recover, right? But that isn't what happens. Not only do you get urban sprawl and you get many urban poor in parts of urban areas where you have very little green space, very little biodiversity, but those areas and the rural areas that they've left, 
they don't regenerate to natural areas. They're just more likely to go under industrial scale agriculture. And industrial scale agriculture is far less biodiverse and less heterogeneous than small scale locally run small holdings. And so you might think, oh, it's great. They're all moving. We can let this area recover. But the opposite happens. And so then you lose the urban biodiversity and you lose the rural biodiversity. But hey, you've got fewer people, right? And that that's meant to be the answer. So we've got to stop simplifying it to just one plus one. People are not just units of flesh. We are thinking acting beings. And the impact of us as individuals is disproportionate based on our consumption choices and our wealth. So you have some surprising allies in your fight against the overpopulation narrative. Uh, Elon Musk recently stated that he thinks uh, Paul Alex's book, The Population Bomb, uh, which I mentioned before, is, uh, quote, the most damaging anti-human thing ever written. I mean, his motivations for saying this are likely slightly different than <laughs> your own. But do you see a general shift in the public perception or is it very much an uphill battle? I think... Again, humans are not uniform. You get some people who are willing to think about it more. And there are others who are like, oh, I can scapegoat all responsibility by just blaming them. But that doesn't provide solutions. I think when people really think about it and think about, for example, if everyone thinks about what they consume today, where did it come from? Which part of the planet? Do you have flowers in the middle of your table? And if so, were they grown in Kenya at the expense of the... Maasai populations who now don't have as many grazing lands as they used to, we need to realize what an interconnected planet we live in. And if you think about what your parents were growing up on, this is a shift that is relatively recent. And so I think a lot of it comes down to basic accountability. If we think about it, we know what the problems are. But rather than being accountable, it's much easier to try to say, well, it's a problem that it, it's their problem. It's not my problem. We cannot afford to keep blaming other people. We need to be accountable. And that means generating solutions at home. And it does take all of us. It doesn't just take the individual. It takes the big corporations and government, too. This is a solution that needs to be in all of our hands. But what we cannot afford to do, and we've seen this with climate change, too, is say, it's someone else's responsibility and I'm not empowered to act on this. And this is what a continued narrative around depopulation does. It puts the problem in someone else's hands so we don't have to act. And whilst they may say, well, this is how we solve the problems, it isn't. It doesn't solve any problems. In fact, it only generates problems and it also distracts us from generating the real solutions that we do urgently need. What, what are some modern day examples of how concentrated populations manage to live alongside thriving biodiversity? Well, there are many examples in different parts of the planet with different population sizes. But I think what's more useful is to think in some of the most biodiverse parts of the planet, why we are losing biodiversity. So if you went to the Amazon, if you went to Indonesia, we are seeing industrial scale agriculture that is wiping out forest environments. In Indonesia, it's palm oil. Now, much of that palm oil is for export, but about 87% of global palm oil production is from just Indonesia and Malaysia. And that's not just in foodstuffs, it's in virtually every commodity. And many of these economies, these developing economies, which is where we have the majority of the world's biodiversity, are now export-based economies, with many of those exports going to the West. If we were to go to Brazil, um, the grazing of cattle and the production of soy, as well as a few other commodities, are what is driving forest loss. And so it's these production trains that are causing the issues. And that means it is very hard to say, oh, well, th this city is living happily alongside biodiversity because the way the income is generated in these economies is often for export. And so, again, it's a much more complex problem. But what we can also see say is countries with the highest national happiness index are countries like Bhutan. Bhutan is also the country with the largest on average forest patch size of any country in Asia, despite being a 
fraction of the size of almost any country. And that's because there has been top-down governance structures that ensure that they do not lose biodiversity, they do not destroy rainforests and um, other natural environments. And also tourism, it's so expensive there that they have a small number of tourists that can then support their economies. And so by developing these more innovative and holistic measures, they can maintain a very healthy economy. They can actually have a much happier population without necessarily needing to destroy all their natural resources. And so it requires a fundamental rethink of our relationship with nature. Another good example is Costa Rica, where the former minister for mines and agriculture was also the minister for environment. And by actually coalescing those two polar opposite ministries, the two could be coordinated to develop solutions. So when new infrastructure was input, protected areas were put alongside that infrastructure to prevent the deforestation that normally occurs around development. This is what we need, holistic thinking so that we can generate solutions that maintain life quality, that provide us with the services we need whilst maintaining biodiversity. And this is what biodiversity mainstreaming means. It means that rather than having to make hard decisions, that often will not last. We make it easier to make sustainable choices, which means that in the long run, we can maintain life quality whilst maintaining biodiversity. Hmm. My last question to you, Alice, before we move on to some, uh, some audience questions. Um, earlier during the seminar, Sophie Howe explained to us how Wales goes about working for better representation for future generations in, in the present. Of course, there's also a movement underway seeking to ensure representation for non-human entities, including uh, rights or personhoods for ecosystems, uh, landscapes, animals, and so on. It's taken hold mostly in countries in the global south with uh, high degrees of biodiversity and indigenous populations. Do you see this as a possible solution or at least as part of the solution? Well, I'm told that the rights of rivers, which I think was uh, from New Zealand, has been very, very successful. And in fact, if you look at my co-author list, um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with my co-authors on this piece, many of them are from countries like Brazil. The reality is that many of these countries feel disenfranchised and marginalized by continued arguments that say, well, it, it's your fault, when it clearly isn't. And colonialism has a lot to answer for. But we need to hear all of these voices if we are going to develop workable solutions, especially as a disproportionate amount of global biodiversity occurs in these regions. Also, if you listen to the last climate talks, there is now what is being called an OPEC for nature, an OPEC for rainforests, where the three nations with the most forests on Earth, Indonesia, Congo and Brazil, united together. Now. If those countries oppose other nations in terms of climate change, that is disastrous for climate and biodiversity. We cannot afford a, bi a, a polarized debate saying, well, it's your fault. Because unless we develop collaborative solutions and we listen to these voices, then we've already lost. Even if you look at the language within the post-2020 framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity, you will see terms like Mother Nature enshrined. Now, in Western economies, we often look down on terms like Mother Nature. We see them as something that is somehow inferior. Again, we cannot afford to do that. We need to look with equitable and democratic solutions across countries and create inclusive language that empowers other nations that we are going to develop these solutions together. Part of it involves things like sustainable supply chains, because the reality is that unless we have supply chains that we know if we are deforesting another nation, these solutions will be unworkable. And in fact, one of the reasons that targets like the Aichi targets failed is we continue to put the responsibility on countries that actually the reason they're losing biodiversity is because of imports from developed economies. So we need to develop these solutions together. We need to work collaboratively and equitably to create financially viable solutions to allow these nations to maintain their biodiversity whilst maintaining a high quality of life and protecting livelihoods in all of these countries, which isn't easy, but it requires collaboration and democratization of language as well as inclusivity.
Let's move on to some um, audience questions. We've got a, a few good ones coming in here. This one from uh, Ben Capper is very interesting. Um, ben asks, to what extent do Western cultural assumptions about the developed world drive the supposed overpopulation thesis? Yep. Great question. And yes, it has a huge role to play. Now, I think this is for a number of reasons. One, it's because it's it's a very nice, easy narrative that means I don't have to do anything and I can go about with my life because it's it's their problem, not mine. But it also it it shows a complete ignorance of what the real drivers look like. And if we look at what the exports look like from almost any developing economy, Almost all of their exports are to high income economies. And so, yes, this is a narrative coming from the West, partly because it's convenient, but it's also a denial of all of the economic realities of what is actually driving biodiversity loss in these countries. Um, thank you for that question, Ben. Um, a question here from uh, Brianna Nicholas, who asks, have you read the findings of the latest IPCC report? And if so, what do you think of its conclusions uh, taken in the context of biodiversity decline, climate change, and supposed overpopulation? So I haven't read the details of the latest IPCC report, which I think came out yesterday. Um, but they are, yeah, they are broadly linked with the reports we've seen previously. Um, if we were to look at the IP bears report, which came out last year, it shows that the over harvest of wildlife is one of the major threats to biodiversity. And a lot of that, as I've stated previously, is disconnected with population because things like pet trade, fashion trade, uh, even things like fishing are much more correlated with Western diets and Western consumption that are associated much more with GDP per capita rather than population. Within the context of the IPPC, we also need to think about what these policies look like around things like energy production. The EU Biofuels Initiative, which was meant to be a biofuels initiative to reduce climate change, was so simplified that it actually drove deforestation, um, which doesn't really help with climate change. So yeah, of course, the IPPC report is useful. But these reports build on things that we already know. And what we now need to see is action. And that action cannot afford to be simple. If we have solutions that are oversimplified, if we see a disconnection between biodiversity and climate solutions, which we do see with things like the uh, climate COP and the biodiversity COP, we get suboptimal solutions which are doomed to failure. For example, many of the tree planting initiatives that have been associated with the climate cops actually have very high rates of tree mortality of up to about 80% within three years, as well as not maintaining biodiversity. And so we cannot afford to look at climate without also aligning it with biodiversity goals, or we will lose at both of those. And that requires a much more holistic, longer term think about what all of these structures look like, be it energy production or food consumption, because all of these are part of the much bigger picture of unsustainable use of natural resources. We're running out of time. I think that's all we had time for today. Um, I want to thank you, Alice, for taking all our questions. Um, and thank you so much to Sophie Howe for joining us as well. Uh, and to all you watching, I really hope you enjoyed today's seminar and I hope to see you next time. As promised in the beginning, we'll share a few QR codes to, to this thing here and to our memberships and what else we have going on at the Institute. So thank you all for tuning in and see you next time.